I was holding his hand. I realised that he was fading away. I saw a small mustard cloud emanate from his chest. I thought it through and I thought he's not breathing that out. It's not coming out from any other orifice. I believe that was his soul leaving his body in the maybe five minutes or so before he actually died. Welcome to Don't Be Caught Dead, a podcast encouraging open conversations about dying and the death of a loved one. I'm your host, Catherine Ashton, founder of Critical Info, and I'm helping to bring your stories of death back to life. Because while you may not be ready to die, at least you can be prepared. Don't Be Caught Dead acknowledges the lands of the Kulin Nations and recognises their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nation peoples around the globe. Susan Bollard believes everyone deserves a chance to learn to dance. Susan purchased Showbiz Dance Studio in 1990. It is Frankston's longest-running, most successful dance studio. Susan and her team of instructors are passionate about dance, and whether it's salsa, waltz, rock and roll, or cha-cha, her studio is the place for the local community to learn socially dancing, even if it's at a slower pace for her all-abilities classes. However, when Susan's landscape designer husband Phil died, she found out that she was the one that had to learn many things herself. This is Susan's story. Thanks for joining us today, Susan. No, thank you for inviting me. Now, Susan, can you please tell me about the time someone close to you died? I think given that I'm a baby boomer, there would be several instances I could tell you about, all with different outcomes. But most recently, my husband died uh, nearly three years ago. He had been uh, one of the fittest men you could ever come across. He should have been the pin-up boy for men's health. Uh, He had a habit of every year when he bought a a diary, he'd open to the same date in June and write that date down and organise to have an annual medical. And for the 23 years we were together, I think he had that every year for 23 years, full medical workup, blood tests because he always talked about having baseline data. He said, if you're going to get sick, you need to know what the situation was like before. He wasn't a drinker, he wasn't a smoker, and he was a really fit man. And as it came as a real shock that he moved the trailer one day, he said, I've got a pain in the back. That was on a Sunday. The following Thursday, he said, my back's still hurting. I said, better go to the doctor. He went on Friday, and on the Monday, he was diagnosed with final stage pancreatic cancer. So a real shock to uh, to us as a couple uh, with a really, really fit man and no signs of ill health at all, but that's the way with pancreatic cancer. And what happened after you received that diagnosis? Oh, life went into free fall. It was in COVID times. So we got the uh, the initial scan that it showed that he had pancreatic cancer. The only way, because it's very difficult to diagnose, was that they had to do some surgery. So he was in at the Cabrini Hospital and the specialist was going to put a telescopic instrument down, have a little bit of a look at the situation and make a determination of what would happen next because none of the MRIs or CAT scans give a definitive answer. The surgery proceeded without me being at the hospital. I wasn't allowed to go up there because of the COVID restrictions. The telescope went down, they did all of their observation, everything showed that because the cancer hadn't moved into Phil's abdomen, that it would be uh, pragmatic to remove uh, the cancer, and the diagnosis was, or prognosis, was that he would probably go on to live a you know quite a healthy life, keeping an eye on his diet, uh, into the future. The Upshot came when the surgery commenced and they lifted up the tumour that they were removing to find that completely invisible from the telescopic investigation, the cancer had actually perforated Phil's abdomen. So that meant that the surgery ceased at that stage. Uh, He was sewn up and put back together again. And for him, very poignantly, was put back in a hospital bed in a room with no one. 
There was no one to talk to. He could phone me, but because he was still coming out of the whole realisation of the situation, that was somewhat difficult for him. They eventually, when he asked, found him a social worker. So I think it says a lot about maybe some needs during COVID with major hospitals too. He talked to a social worker and uh, he'd been told he was going to die, but there was no one to to really talk it over with. So eventually I got a phone call to say he's quite restless. I'm surprised that they thought that would be strange with that sort of information and asked me if I could come up almost immediately. And I was teaching from home, luckily. So I just got in the car and drove up and spent a couple of hours with him up there and and talked it over. And that was the first time that he'd really had an opportunity to process it with anyone. And then he was sent home a couple of days later. Again, it was all because of COVID, quite bizarre, but just drive up and someone would deliver him to the front door. And then I put him in the car and off we went home again. No support really at all from the hospital or anyone else. The um, surgeon had said, uh, must have spoken to us, we must have had an interview with him after that, and he'd said, look, really the best thing you could do is just go home and enjoy the rest of the time that you've got left. Uh, But we were referred to an oncologist and she had a, a completely counter perspective on the whole thing and said, no, surgeons are just slice and dice. If they can't fix you one way, they're not interested. But, of course, you've got to have chemotherapy. And we got caught up in a whirlwind of surgeon's advice of just enjoy the time you've got or the chemotherapy where he was very, very ill. It's a very invasive program. And it turned out that that also a full cycle of chemo showed no chemo markers in his blood. So it looked as though the... um, meeting in the afternoon was going to be good, only for the oncologist to say, no, there's been huge incremental growth in the tumour, so that hasn't worked either. All the way along, he'd been saying, I'm having real trouble when I eat, I'm feeling nauseous all the time, and people just gave him increasing amounts of uh, nausea medication, probably misdiagnosis right from the get-go. Um, he had, which is common with pancreatic cancer, a blocked duodenum, So the food was just wellowing up and uh, wasn't clearing away. So they tried to put a stent in. Uh, That surgery also failed. It was 95, I think, percent deployed. Wouldn't deploy the last few percent. So that took that out as well as part of the equation. And when he died, he actually died of not the cancer, not the pancreatic cancer, but uh, an infection that he'd acquired in the hospital. And and what period of time was it from him dying and his initial diagnosis after? He was diagnosed at the end of September and he died in February the following year. And that was including that round of chemotherapy yep. that he did? It, it became from the time of diagnosis until the time that he died, it was just a series of medical interventions. So our life wasn't our own. It was just, it's a doctor, it's chemo, it's this, it's that. And I was still, I work as a full-time secondary school teacher and I was going to work during the day and when I had a later start or an early finish, school was very accommodating and I was able to uh, to be there as much as I could. And he was well enough to be in the house on his own though and school had the understanding that if I got a phone call, I just had to go. And we had a couple of good friends who would uh, drop in on times when I thought the the time period might have been a bit long. So he was coherent and understanding and everything all the way through that. And then the the last more difficult stage all occurred during um, the school holiday period when I finished up in December from school. And with him dying in February, um, I was with him for all of those school holidays. So the timing uh, was such that he had, you know, had me there all the time. And it was during, still during COVID, this period? Yes. Even after he died, we weren't sure what was going to happen with a funeral uh, because people were only being allowed to go to funerals, you know, a few at a time. At one stage, I think it was four or five, and then it went to nine, uh, two days before Phil's funeral. So we organised a funeral not knowing whether it was actually going to happen because there was talk with the state government that they might be changing the rules 
and the rules changed on the Wednesday. His funeral was, I think, on the Friday, and he was able to have a, a huge funeral at the church of his choice in Mornington, and it was a, a normal funeral. So, you know, timing was everything there. And in that lead up that you had with him, had you had discussions about what his wishes were about death and what he wanted uh, after his death? Not until the the absolute last stage when he was in hospital after they diagnosed the the blocked duodenum, because I think that he was always, and, and even if I was looking retrospectively, the chemotherapy was designed to get him better for a period. The surgery had been designed to give him greater length of life. So it was the surgery, expectations for a future, chemotherapy with expectations of the future, the operation to put the stent in, still with expectations that there was going to be a good outcome. And it was only at the, the last stage and I think you get so overwhelmed with the medical things that are going on that we had our wills done. All of that part was quite sensibly done. Uh, he had written a small exercise book with all of his passwords, his bank account numbers and things like that. So that was invaluable to try and sort of work out what was going on afterwards. Without the passwords, I wouldn't have been able to get into computers. And he had another house that was used as his design practice. Um, utilities won't speak to you unless you're either the executor or uh, the person involved. So for me to try and live our normal life and pay bills and do things without being able to have passwords and things, I wouldn't have been able to transact anything. And life had to go on. And, you know, I don't think utility companies and things make life very easy at all. And tell me, how how did you, how was the funeral organised for, for Phil? I could have made a huge mistake and I'll go a little bit back in the story. I was going home from the hospital one night and I said, I'm just going out. I'll be back in an hour to go home and feed the dogs. And the nurse on reception said, oh, have you got the details of Phil's funeral director? And I said, I beg your pardon? Because at that stage, we were expecting Phil to be coming home and arrangements had been made for district nursing service and all sorts of things to be happening at home in two days' time. And I thought I was just going to feed the dogs, and she asked me about the funeral arrangements. And I said, no, handed me a brochure. So I went home, and in the time that I was feeding the dogs, which was just on an hour round trip, I couldn't think what to do, so I popped into my neighbours who were both older people and members of a, a golf club, I thought, well, maybe this is... And I said, could you tell me with people you know and friends at the golf club locally, who are the funeral directors that everyone goes to? I don't know any funeral directors. And they told me the name of the company that everyone used as being the most reliable. So I made a quick phone call to them and said, you know, I've been asked this question. Do you take anyone on? And they said, yes, we do. So then I reported back at about 6.30 and said, oh, let it be this particular company. Mentioned it to Phil and he said to me, well, what would you do for a funeral service for me? It was like a quiz. And I said, oh, well, the place at Mount Martha on the Esplanade is very nice. It seems very tasteful. And he said, oh, you would have done a good job doing that. But no, I would have hoped you would have picked a church. And he hadn't been to church in the 23 years that we'd been together. So I said, well, what church would that be? And he told me, and he had had a very long affiliation there as a younger person and been a youth worker associated with them. And he had worked for a Christian organisation before he and I had met. So then I rang up the minister and had a bit of a chat with her and uh, she asked if I'd like her to come into the hospital. And I facilitated that. And then he and she sat down together and talked it over there and... Uh, they worked it out together then. But I would have got it completely wrong. So Phil uh, wanted to have a, a religious service. Absolutely, yes. And that was something that he hadn't given you any indication prior? No, and I'd asked him lots of times in the time that we were together uh, whether he was only not going to church because of me. Uh, 
I would have been more than happy if he'd tootled off and gone to church groups and things. He was, I think fundamentally, he was a Christian through and through from his upbringing. But when we'd met, his Christian friends were quite spiteful in their attitudes to the fact that I was a divorced person and really went out of their way to be quite mean. I was referred to, despite all the professional things I've accomplished in my life, I was referred to at a, a wedding that we went to by his colleagues as, oh, you've brought the ballroom dancer. And I just took that on the chin and so did Phil and he moved away from working for a Christian organisation then and uh, had a complete career change to work in uh, the garden design industry. So was Phil your second husband, was he? Yes, he he was, yeah. Okay. I was divorced and um, we met after he was separated for a considerable period of time. He wasn't divorced because he thought divorcing would upset his daughter, who was 12 or 13 at that stage. So we were together for just over, oh, we only married in the November, after he was diagnosed in the November before he married, he died in the February. So even though we'd been together all of that time and the majority of the people that knew us just assumed that we were married, it had never come up as an issue for anyone to ask us. So yeah, we got married toward the end and that was, it sounds a bit of a, a bizarre thing to say, but that was a suggestion of the accountant that we'd had for years and she was also a marriage celebrant and she knew both of us and she thought that that would be a really good thing to do. So we got married in our neighbour's garden with our accountant come marriage celebrant, who's a beautiful woman. And because it was COVID, uh, we had to pick eight selected people. We had a group photo taken, so it it looked as though it was a group of uh, older age people getting ready for a bus tour to the pokies or something. But it, it was a very lovely event. The catering was whip around to the local bakery and buy some lovely cakes from there and sausage rolls and and done in the dining room because, again, Phil was too ill to go. We couldn't go to a restaurant because restaurants weren't open. He couldn't get married in the gardens because he had to have particular criteria of toilets and things and they weren't undoing the toilets because of COVID. Yeah. So uh, we came up with our own little version of what was a a very lovely uh, and memorable day. And our our accountant friend was was really right in saying that that was the right thing to do. Oh, that's so special. Yep. And did you, you mentioned that you had written wills? Yes. Yeah, I'm very definite that everyone has to have a will and uh, it doesn't matter whether you own very little or whether you own a lot. I I think a will is a document that, that, that specifies what you want done. And did you also have power of attorneys written as well? No, we didn't have power of attorney, uh, but being his wife, that was one of the reasons I think the accountant wanted me to be his wife because I was able to make decisions at the hospital that I wouldn't have been able to make if I was his partner. That wouldn't have been uh, treated in the same way. Uh, But it did have, not being a financial power of attorney, there was nothing I needed to do. We had separate money. We had a joint account, but... I could transact those things and I was not the executor of his will, which is probably where the most difficult part came in because you can't do anything with any uh, mobile phones or iPads, any organisation that you have that you deal with, Telstra, Origin, through the business. Unless you're the executor, you can't transact any of that to keep your own combined life going. So that was more important, I think, than anything else. But that, had I been financial power of attorney anyway, that would all se- have ceased at the time of his death. So the person that you select as your executor, I think, is the paramount decision. And I wouldn't have known that before of how difficult that was going to be. And can you talk me through some of the challenges that you discovered, you know, about that after Phil died? Well, he had his own home that he used as a design studio about 300 metres from where we lived uh, to keep the, because various organisations are notified at the time of someone's death, you can't own property if you're deceased. So with the council, the rates had to be paid. 
but were they going to send the rates to me? Well, no, they would send the rates to the executor, but the executor was very tardy in documentation that he sent to me. Um, you can't keep your light bill or your gas bill and all sorts of things going. That's all in the hands of the executor. And yet I didn't want to come home and find that the lights were out of my house or something like that, or the lights were out in the other house. We'd use both properties simultaneously. And yet for one of them, I was quite cut off from uh, being able to transact things for that house. So you know, that that did cause some real dilemmas at the time. And people are quite intransigent. Unless you're the executor, they won't deal with you. And would you say in your personal experience, that is one of the biggest challenges that you've experienced? Absolutely. Yeah. Even to the stage that time has moved on, it will be three years in February. It's only relatively recently that I've got the title to one of our vehicles that I've been driving around since then because uh, the executor was tardy in just deciding not to sign paperwork that was sent to him through the solicitor. So unless the person's on the ball and, and sees something as being a priority, it was making my life very difficult. So fortunately now, through my own chasing around and things, getting a signature on a piece of paper from the, the executor and then having some amazing people at Vic Roads who helped me, they talked me through what I would need to do as a minimum to get that done and I couldn't speak more highly of Vic Roads, just the most beautiful people. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And you mentioned when Phil was, was ill and the challenges around COVID at that time. Yep. Uh, what support would you have liked to have been given during that period that perhaps wasn't or or could you give an example of, of what was done well? And I think what was done appallingly, and uh, I wrote to them at Cabrini Hospital, a man shouldn't be told that surgery had failed and that his prognosis was quite final and be left in a room for, I've forgotten the amount of time now, but probably about five days without being able to see anyone in his immediate family. I understood COVID. I understood the dilemmas of people bringing disease into a hospital. Uh, even before he went into hospital, he, he and I both had to have COVID tests. And from the time that he had the test, a certain amount of days had to elapse and I wasn't allowed to leave the property again at that stage. So we had to have our milk milk and bread hung in a supermarket bag, a plastic bag as it was then, have that hung on the gate because they didn't want us to, to gain any infection. So we had that period of isolation at home and when I dropped him at the hospital, I had to just drop him at the door and similarly when I picked him up to go home, he was brought down to the, the front door by the staff and then just bundled into my car and off we drove home. But I think that was just so callous and unprofessional to not have anyone there and it was only when I insisted that they must have had some sort of social worker on staff. And they had a civilian visitor, I think, was the person that sat with him for a little while. And what are the sort of things that you feel in hindsight now, would have been really beneficial for for you to have had of that support at that stage? The private hospital was very negligent. I, I should have taken an action of negligence against them afterwards for his treatment there. But a friend who's involved in the medical system said, don't even bother, they just cover up. And it's happened to two other friends more recently. But I would like someone at the hospital to have sort of sat me down and said, look, you know, this is some of the things that you probably need to think about, some of the things that you need to work through. Yes, it's COVID times. This is some of the dilemmas. Um, but finding out that I had to find out about a funeral director when I was going for, a, you know, a dog feed break uh, was very confronting and, again, a very unprofessional approach. So whether it's down to COVID and that's why hospitals were so ill-prepared or whether hospitals are so blasé with dealing with it all the time, uh, I, I think there's a lot of scope that more should happen there. Even if it had been a booklet or something someone had given me in advance so that the two of us, when Phil was quite lucid as he was, we could have sat there and talked it through. But he was expecting to get better and we'd been led, because he was coming home, 
to believe that we had that time at home to do those sorts of things. Uh, initially, it was about you know prognosis six to eight years. Then it was going to be a couple of years, and then it came down to the final stage, which was a couple of a uh, couple of weeks. And from when I took him back to the hospital, uh, he didn't come out. That was about two weeks in hospital then. And are you comfortable talking to me about that period when those last few weeks when when Phil was in hospital? Yep, not a problem. Some people would say that I handled what they might describe as grief quite differently to others, but I think I'd like to think I'm a sensible and pragmatic person and I was fairly stoic in just knowing I had to work through things because I have no children. He had a daughter who was living overseas, so I was really, it was down to me to do things. So, yeah. And what are the sort of things that you, you prepared in those, in those sort of weeks? Well, once we realised how he was not going to get any better and there was nothing more medically that we could do, we made the arrangements for his funeral. I organised for the minister at the church that he wanted. He wanted a church funeral. Uh, organised the minister to come in and sit with him and talk with him and talk over aspects of the service. So he had a, a real call in that. He went through with his little book of passwords and bank account numbers, where to find things like that. He was very, very ill, but was determined that I was going to learn how to use the ride on mower that I'd never used, how to start the brush cutter. We live on a substantial size property, and there were things that he thought I just needed to to learn to know just to get by until I got myself sorted out. So I was very much appreciative of that, and that was the sort of partnership we had that, you know, he would be going, but I would have to manage after he was gone. And from your point of view, what do you believe are probably the most challenging things when you're looking at, you know, facing a loved one's death? Talking openly about death and grief can sometimes be triggering. If you find you need support, please reach out to our support services and the bereavement organisations listed on our resource hub. All links are in the show notes of this episode. I had a a list that he'd given me of once he'd actually died, who I had to ring. And I, I think looking at the list of people before he'd died and that was all typed up. He'd sat down on the computer and he'd typed up the list of people. I think looking at that and realising that everything was going to be final and I had to sort of follow through with that, that was one of the really difficult things. And and just trying to keep his spirits up in hospital when because he was a Christian and because he knew he wasn't getting better, He was ready to go. He was on a mission that he knew where he was going. He was not fearful of dying. He was ready to be out of there. Uh, So it was a real contradiction for me of sitting and chatting and buoying his spirits, but also knowing that he was, if he could have gone any day there, he was not wanting to to linger on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from your personal experience with, with Phil and, and other experiences in your life, uh, how would you recommend or suggest people can support you during you know, that period and, and after when someone dies? Oh, a really difficult question, that one, because it hits at what I had to do for myself after the funeral. From the time that Phil passed away in the hospital, the realisation was very much, you're on your own, girl. You've just got to, you know, got to do this. There weren't people who were offering help, and I don't think I probably needed help because I knew what had to be done. But people meaning really well and uh, ringing my young colleagues at school when I took a, a period of bereavement leave, there's a a period of, I had three 
two weeks, three weeks of bereavement leave. And they were trying to be nice, but they would say, are you feeling better? And each, each person who would say, are you feeling better? I got to the stage I wanted to scream at them and say, I haven't had the flu. And yet I would smile and nod and say, yes, you know, we're getting by. People would say to me, I can't believe, you know, the grief, the grief you must be going through. And it was strange. I had to sort of play a role in, I want to say, it's not grief. And eventually I did this and it's not grief, it's bewilderment. Uh, One moment you're part of a, a team and you work very successfully as a team. And then you find that everything in your life that's meshed together for, you know, 23 plus years, uh, you've suddenly got to unravel that to run things on your own again. And that takes a lot of confidence. And I did things that I think people who were maybe more Phil's friends probably thought was a bit odd. About two weeks after his funeral, I rang up a friend who had a dance studio and a social dance, and I said, this is what's happened. I own another studio, so you don't necessarily, in case they think you're trying to do intellectual uh, espionage or something of their business, I said, I would like to come dancing because I've got to find who I used to be before I was part of a team. And I used dance and going where there were completely anonymous people that would ask me nothing about Phil, nothing about my life, nothing about how I was coping. So that was my strategy that worked well for me to strengthen myself by uh, pushing myself to go to places where no one knew me. And dancing was fabulous for me because you drive yourself there, you go in, you talk to people politely while you're there, you dance with people, you get in your own car and you go home. It's just the old-fashioned sort of cliche of a safe place to go. And so you found yourself by anonymity. Absolutely. And I cope much better with that, and I've suggested that to people. Maybe I was lucky in that I didn't have children, and that sounds a strange thing to say, but people in my own age group who've got children seem to get closeted by their children, and they seem to get looked after in a way that their children think that they need looking after and the children seem seem to take over the role of managing their life. And then I meet meet a lot of these people when they come to the dance studio maybe 12 months or two years later where they're trying to find themselves then when they realize that they've been smothered by their close family and particularly their children and they try and find themselves, whereas I knew having no one I had to find myself very quickly and I had to find out what gave me my tenacity and my strength uh, all those years ago before I met Phil. I had my business, the dance studio, before I met Phil and I knew that I could run that business on my own and I had to find that again and that was my strategy and I think that was my strength too that worked really well for me. And that's what gave you the confidence was? Absolutely, because I... I knew that I had been a very confident individual as a single person. I had been a part of a very strong team, but I had to work out how to work as that very independent, confident person again because the team had been disbanded. So, And what other skills did you find yourself having to take on? You mentioned the ride-on mower, the whippersnipper. Did you have to now start paying bills or? I'd always paid all of my own bills. We'd we'd had two houses and uh, one had been used as a design office and the other one had been the house that we lived in. Uh, Phil was in the middle of thinking about a renovation and I wasn't quite sure what to do with the other house. Um, I found out very quickly that legally you have two years to sell a property if you're going to sell a property before you incur capital gains tax uh, and all sorts of things. And two years is a very short period of time, particularly when COVID impacted on a very significant part of that time. Um, Almost 12 months of it was taken up with things to do with the COVID lockdowns. It was, I couldn't think what to do. So I thought, well, yes, he had asbestos walls on two sides that he was going to take down. So I renovated his house. 
the windows had to be replaced, I put new windows in. And that was probably going through the motions of doing things that I thought were sensible things to do. As it turned out then, uh, towards the end of the two years, I got my first real shock financially in regards to his house. I, I hadn't rented it out. I put a, a friend in as a caretaker with no rent because that meant that the insurance was still covered. Uh, but I was still maintaining the extensive grounds there. And I found out that I then was incurring land tax. So by the time I had the impost of land tax, the insurance for the house and the extensive rates, just to keep the house long enough for me to work out what to do with it, would have been nearly $10,500 a year. And out of a single teacher's salary, that was just too much. So that was the catalyst that led me to, against my better judgment, but now I know I did the right thing, to have to sell the house. And that takes a lot of confidence to actually make that decision. Did you? Did it impact on your grieving, having to let go of the house? Or, or how did you feel about that process? Um, I felt it wasn't so much grief, it was guilt because I, I knew that the house was very special to him and the house was filled with his lifetime treasures going back to diaries that he'd had from year eight and things. So to sell the house meant that I also had to empty the house. So it was filing cabinets of personal documents and anecdotes that he'd held on to since he was, a, I suppose, a 14-year-old boy. There were things that I was reading that I would open something before I threw it out to make sure that it was something that I should have been throwing out. And sometimes I'd think, no, this was something that I shouldn't be reading, so I'd have to close it up very quickly. I made up boxes. He'd had his mother and father's memorabilia in the house. So I made up boxes for things to go to his siblings and things to be boxed up to hang on to for his daughter, who in fact subsequently has come back to Australia. So I was able to give those boxes to her so that she could go through that grief pro process that she hadn't been able to manage uh, because she hadn't been in Australia at the time. So there was a lot of lot of sorting, a lot of culling, a lot of feeling badly about what to do with his beautiful architectural books. He was a design, he worked as an architectural draftsman, but he was also in his own right a landscape designer. So he did both businesses simultaneously. And I've still got a room full of books that I had to go out to Ikea and buy bookcases for because I didn't have the heart to get rid of his precious professional library. I'm never going to read three or four Ikea bookshelves full of uh, bookcases full of professional books, but I felt obliged to do justice to that by hanging on to them. But it was a, it was a big process. It sounds like it. And has there been any incidents that have influenced your personal thoughts on death? I didn't want to ever be cremated. I wanted to be buried. I wanted them to play the the only request I had was uh, the music always look on the bright side and everyone encouraged to click and clap along as I went out. I was very reluctant to tell anything anyone much about Phil's death. Uh, I was with him sitting with him at the time that he died. But I've become more confident with sharing that. Phil was a very Christian person and had no doubts about where he was going. I was holding his hand, I realized that he was fading away. I saw a mustard, can only describe a small mustard cloud emanate from his chest. I thought it through and I thought he's not breathing that out. It's not coming out from any other orifice. I believe that was his soul leaving his body in the maybe five minutes or so before he actually died. His hand was still warm and you could still feel life, but I went out and I said to the nurse, I think you better come in. I think Phil's died, and she confirmed that, yes, he had, but it would take another five minutes. That gave me quite the profound experience to, to think about my own death and death in general, that when we organise a funeral for someone, they're somewhere else probably looking on. They're not actually there. And uh, so my ideas will have to be reviewed when I 
get around to it. And that's the next stage for me to think through of how do I feel about funerals and uh, and things. I'm not a religious person, so it wouldn't be a church service. So yeah, it's it's changed my way of thinking much more significantly than I would have ever thought in a profound way. And you mentioned that you don't have children. No. You've you've had your own will. Yep. What other sort of planning, obviously you're, you're starting to think about what you would, would like for your, your own funeral. What other things have you, you considered in relation to this? Well, because of this rethinking it, I always thought that I would be buried in a cemetery. And Again, I, I teach sustainability. Phil was very big on sustainability and the whole idea of taking up land by cemeteries is something that I'll have to, to come to consider. I think having worked on traditional history for years and things, um, I always used to joke to people and say, well, I don't want to turn up in the next life with a, a few bits missing if that's what happens after cremation. But I, I will have to rethink that in time, but the time hasn't been at the moment. And I understand that if I went suddenly tomorrow, that would be someone's problem to sort out. But, you know, I'll come to that in time, but that's not the right time yet. But I have put that on the agenda for more thinking about. And given your personal experience, is there any advice or encouragement you'd like to share with others? I think on the sensible side of having documentation. I've been recently asked to do this with a friend. Her children didn't want to ask their mum about her arrangements. So only a week ago, I was asked to speak to my friend and say, look, you know, things are are not good and we, we know that. What arrangements have you got? And she said, I really haven't got any. And she and I talked through those sorts of things about passwords and the pragmatic side that her bills would be paid while she's uh, still in hospital and when she passes away, it's a direct debit until that stage, Uh, the nuts and bolts of it. But also by me having the conversation with her, um, I said, I think you need to talk to your children about that. Uh, She subsequently done that. Her daughter then spoke to me and said, I don't think I'm handling mum being so matter of fact about all of this. But I think my friend feels much better now that, like Phil, she was going through what she wants them to know and and that's an imminent situation. So I think she's taking control of it. So I think taking control of, you know, of your own affairs there probably. The other side of it for the person who's left behind, I think you really uh, have to, it doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're younger or you're older, and it's going to be really difficult, but I think you have to find your own self and not rely too much on others. I think from a lot of people that I uh, meet through the dance studio, it sometimes takes them several years because their children like to closet them and pamper them and look after them and almost manage the life of the one left behind. But that means once you dust yourself off, what your children or your close associates want for you or think is good for you may not necessarily, uh, once you've thought about it, be what you want for yourself. And and life truly does go on. And um, mine, I said before, wasn't so much grief as bewilderment. I think that you have to handle that situation in a way that is best for you, that you go on and honour the life of the person who passed away by giving the best quality to your life and you being the best person you can be going forward, not placating others by doing what they think is right for you and what they think would be good for you. Be feisty, be determined and be yourself. And keep on dancing, I'm sure. Oh, if, if I could say to anyone, it's not about the dancing. For me, I will never be a millionaire from owning a dance business. To me, dancing is a conduit, whether it's death, divorce, uh, just being lost in some way of, you know, losing your job. Dancing is that really safe space where you can go with people of like mind. Everyone's got a story. You don't share your story with anyone there. 
the story is the music, the story is the style, the story is that you become part of a new community. I run a group of, a very loose group out of the dance studio. I nicknamed it the Naughty Ladies to start with. Women who were divorced or widowed, which is not a normal uh, word I'd normally use, but they were sitting home and watching television and they wanted to go out again. They wanted to go and listen to music. They wanted to go out to dinner. So I'd say, all right, let's carpool. And the first time there was five of us and we went out to a fabulous night at the, the jazz club. Then the next time some more people wanted to come. So we had two cars went. Then I started to get phone calls and people said, what do I have to do to join the group of naughty ladies? And I said, well, it's not a, just a very loose arrangement. You don't pay anything. You just say you're going out to a particular band or a dance or a destination. We'd like to tag along. And then some men start, start to say, can men go to the group of naughty ladies? And I said, well, yes, if you're a naughty man. But what it's turned out to be now is I advertise on our um, uh, dance studio Facebook page places that I think will be interesting and enticing. And if anyone wants to go, they just say, can you make a booking? And it's a loose arrangement that people can be their own people. They can go out to things that they would like to go out to and enjoy with their partners before they were either, uh, you know, left on their own after a death or left on their own after divorce. I think it's probably a similar reaction, that one of bewilderment. Oh, that's beautiful, Susan. And is there um, anything else that you'd like to to share or any story you'd like to tell? Oh, there's so many stories and so many different things. Uh, No, I I think probably all I could think of would be just be true to yourself. And, And that will be, there'll be small things, whether you're a lady or a man, the way you dress when you're part of a couple. When you start to go out again, you start to look at your clothes and think, is someone going to think I'm a bit risque if I go out in that? You know, if I go out on my own, are people going to be frowning on that? And you, again, you, you've got, just got to be true to yourself. You want to keep going. You want to be healthy. You want to be vibrant. And you want to go into the future as your own healthy person. And I think just having confidence, you might have to compromise a little bit, you know, for a while, but yeah, be your own person. That's beautiful advice to to end on, Susan. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the time. Oh, thank you for being a, a guest today. M- much appreciated. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Don't Be Caught Dead, brought to you by Critical Info. If you liked the episode, learnt something new, or were touched by a story you heard, we'd love for you to let us know. Send us an email. Even tell your friends. Subscribe so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you can spare a few moments, please rate and review us as it helps other people to find the show. Are you dying to know more? Stay up to date with Don't Be Caught Dead by signing up to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Head to don'tbecaughtdead.com for more information and loads of resources.